Thank you all so much. Um, how's everybody doing? AnacondaCon? Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too, totally. Um, really stoked there's so many people here. I know the camera can't see everyone, but I'm glad the room is packed for the last session of the day. Your introduction to Anaconda Enterprise with probably the most clickbaity title you've ever seen, How to Use Machine Learning to Drive Sales. Um, so real quick, my name is Gus Cavanaugh. If you want to contact me, uh, maybe in lieu of throwing things at me for this presentation, my email is at the bottom, gcavanaugh at anaconda.com. Um, but otherwise, the, the, the only reason I even show a bio slide is to tell you, you've heard from a lot of illustrious speakers, people who have PhDs, who've done really, really interesting things, you know, have spent a lot of time doing hard work around data science. I am not one of those people, and this is not going to be one of those talks. So what we're going to do today, over the next maybe 30 minutes or so with some time for Q&A, is we're going to provide, or I'm hopefully going to provide you with a basic but practical introduction to machine learning. And I'm going to show you how Anaconda Enterprise will make your life easy as a data scientist. So you may ask yourself right off the bat, Gus, wait a second. I'm here at AnacondaCon. I like Anaconda, or presumably you've at least heard about it. I know it's useful. Why would I want an enterprise product? And this, this will be kind of my pitch to you, and then we'll, we'll get into the actual demo. Um, but I think we all know that, you know, as an individual, data science is hard. It's not easy to get started, right? Anaconda solves the core challenges of the data scientist. How do I get my packages installed? How do I get everything configured on my, on my machine, on my laptop? And how do I make myself productive, right? I go to Anaconda. I download the distribution. I click next, 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 add, it to, add Python to my path. I am good to go, right? So why would I need anything else? Well, the answer is that enterprise data science is also hard. And Anaconda Enterprise is designed to solve the core challenges of the enterprise data science team. So we're going to walk through what some of, some of those are and how we address them. I will not claim to solve every enterprise data science challenge that exists. That would basically be impossible. But there are two that we can talk about today, and that I think I can show you something useful uh, that, you, that you might like. And specifically, those are data science teams tend to struggle to work sharing work effectively or working together, right? How do you actually work with multiple people when you're doing a data science project? What we see a lot are teams that are emailing Jupyter Notebooks back and forth, right? They're doing source control from Gmail, from their inbox. This is a challenge, especially as you start to iterate on the models that you develop and build, right? It's not easy. You shouldn't be doing it this way. Sim while there are tools and workflows for software developers, data scientists tend to use some of them piecemeal or some not at all. And this just becomes a difficult thing. So what we want to show you, or what I want to show you, we, the, the royal we, are going to show you is how Anaconda Enterprise is going to make collaboration or just sharing stuff, right? Your projects, access to data, uh, packages, everything you need to do your job is going to be in one place, and it will just work. The second thing, and th this sounds a little kind of high level, but it's like actually having data science impact the business. This is a big challenge we're seeing among, among enterprise customers. They're coming in and they're saying, I've got all these really smart people. They have their PhDs, you know, not like me. And they're doing really good work, but it's stuck in the sandbox. I mean, you may have seen the, uh, the trailer earlier. Hopefully you saw it from the beginning of the, the conference, right? We hear this all the time, that I, we're doing excellent work, but it, it's stuck in our sandbox environment. We're not publishing it out to the business. We're not deploying it out. We're not making these models or dashboards or anything that we've actually done. We're not making it useful. We're not making, no one's able to consume it. So uh, it related to that, it, we hear, oh, well, we've, you know, we're trying to deploy or we're, we've got our, our data science environment configured, but we haven't actually pushed anything out. We're, you know, that's going to be in the next six months or something like that. And there's absolutely no reason that should be the case. Like, we should be, as data scientists, we've, we've all seen the Venn diagram, we should be hitting the business case hard, right? We should absolutely be able to say there, we are able to impact the business, we, we care about ROI, we care about all those things, and we're going to demonstrate, we're going to put something forward that you can use right away, right? We're not, we're not going to stay stuck in the sandbox. Okay. I should warn you, there's a subliminal message to this whole talk, right? Which is, if you want to solve these problems, buy Anaconda Enterprise. Do it now. We have a bunch of salespeople out here in gray shirts. Go find them. And maybe, you know, if you get one, you know, there might be another special data scientist in your life who needs one. Anaconda Enterprise is great for every season. So, you know, it's spring now. You can wear it before Labor Day. Um, you know, pick one up. Pick up two or three. Share them with your friends. You know, the, the bits travel well. It'll fit in your carry-on. Um, but yeah, so please check out Anaconda Enterprise, right, as our solution to these core challenges of the data science team. 
Okay, so how are we going to practically do this today, right? Um, so I, 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 like I said, I had the clickbaity title, How to Use Machine Learning to Drive Sales. I am going to deliver on that title to you all today. Just probably not in the way you would imagine. So many people are familiar with the Titanic data set, right? So you try to predict who survived and who died on the Titanic. In our case, let's go back in time. Let's put ourselves in New York City. The news has just come in. The Titanic has sunk. Many lives are lost. Terrible. But for us, we're in the funeral home business. So this is a huge, huge opportunity, right? These are leads coming in. We, we, need, to, we need to contact these people, right? We, we sell funeral home services or uh, whatever the term is for that industry. And th this means we have customers. We have potential customers. We want to reach out and contact them. So here's the specific opportunity. The White Star Line, the people who uh, have built and operate the Titanic, have agreed to pay all the funeral costs. We have a complete passenger manifest. That was shipped ahead of the Titanic. But we only know, if we're getting you know, wires or cables coming in, right? But we only know a partial list of people who actually survived. We don't know everyone. So what we want to do, and is, this is admittedly very morbid, but we want to call the families of the deceased and sell them our services. There's a challenge, though. Our competitors have the exact same passenger manifest, and they, they are going to be calling, too. So you may say, hey, like another thing, like, look, there aren't that many people on the Titanic, like 1,200 or so. So why not just call everyone on the list, right? Like we're going to just race through this. Let's just go ahead and do it. Well, the reason is that if we call people who actually their, fam their, their uh, relatives survived, if we call them and try to sell them our services, they're going to be really upset. We're going to get bad, like whatever in the Edwardian era Yelp equivalent, we're going to get a lot of bad reviews on that. So we absolutely cannot do that, okay? So we, we will instead, instead of just going down the list, let's use data science, right? This is our challenge, right? So how can we analyze our existing, the, out of the passenger list, out of the people whom we know some survived, some didn't, can we analyze that data? Can we build a model to make a prediction about the passengers for whom we don't know the outcome? And once we've built that model, can we deploy it? Can we take it out of the sandbox? Can we put it into a production environment such that it integrates with, let's say, our CRM, like Salesforce, or the Edwardian era equivalent of Salesforce, such that our, our salespeople can actually use it. They can see when they come in in the morning, they're going to log into their CRM or open up their notebook, and they're going to see these are the hot leads. Call these people right now, right? So this is our challenge. We're going to analyze the data. We're going to see who, who, out of the people we know who've survived and perished, what are their characteristics. We're going to build a model, and then we're going to deploy this model. And we're going to do all of this with Anaconda Enterprise. And again, I want you all thinking, hey, Anaconda Enterprise made this really, really easy to do. I should check this out as an enterprise data science platform. OK, now, why does this matter, right? Because we get a lot of these trivial examples. Why does this matter? Most businesses have some sort of heuristic or many heuristics on how they, are on how they make predictions, right? Peter, in his keynote, referred to this as how you know, data science, he had it in a very nice you know, meta level. Data science is how you think about the future. I won't dare to be so grandiose. But if you think about, like, hey, I have some, I, I use heuristics all the time. Look both ways before I cross the street. I don't use an image algorithm to check, detect if there's a car nearby or some sort of signal processing to gauge audio. Uh, you know, can I hear a car? Or the dew point, maybe humidity has something to do with it. None of those things factor in our decision, right? We just, we have a heuristic, hey, look both ways before you cross the street. We use it. Similarly, most, or if not all of our businesses, use heuristics like these. So the first thing we should do, and we should think of these as models. Models. These are models. These are tools we're using to use data and make predictions. The first thing we should do is we should baseline our heuristics. Then, once we've baselined that, once we see, hey, if look both ways before we cross the street is a good model, we should not, we absolutely should not use machine learning or data science or any of these other tools um, unless we can improve upon our existing, our existing model, right? We should not just throw in some scikit-learn or throw in a deep learning algorithm if it's not actually going to fun, if it's not actually going to move us forward. So that is kind of like my, my, my juxtaposition here to start this talk off is, this is these are the kinds of things we want to do. This is why I think it's important to you, right? We should baseline our heuristic and then we should move forward and actually build the model and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we should throw it out. And what I hope to show you again through Anaconda Enterprise is just how easy it's going to be for us to analyze some data, figure out how well we've been predict making predictions, and then build a model and see if it's useful and publish it out to the business. And if it's not, we can throw it away. Okay, so enough kind of uh, enough of me jabbering here. Let's let's cut over to the data. 
Uh, so welcome to Anaconda Enterprise. Nice to see all of you. I'm going to jump into my example here. So I hope Anaconda Enterprise, as you see it, looks somewhat familiar. It should, these should look like uh, a, this is a collaborative web-based uh, development environment. I have, in this case, I'm, we're, we're using Jupyter Lab as, as part of our front end. Um, you're looking at a Jupyter Notebook, which I hope, I hope looks familiar. In a lot of ways, I, we, we kind of want this, or at least I like it to be boring and familiar, because I use the Anaconda distribution. I want Anaconda Enterprise to kind of replicate the tools that I'm already using. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and run all, this, run all these cells. Let's go through and let's, let's actually look at our data and see what we have. So I'm going to read in this local Excel file, and it's just sitting here in my project environment. In this in this data folder, um, and as I as I look at this data, I see names, I see gender, I see ages, um, a number of other potential features, right? So right off the right off the bat, why don't we just figure out how many people out of our entire data set actually survived? Meaning, how many people are not good leads? These are our bad leads, and we could say, okay, look. 38% of the passengers survived. So we could say, roughly speaking, if we just picked randomly, we'd expect 60% of the people off this list, of the incoming list, would be good leads, somebody we should reach out to. So let's start to aggregate our data, though. I, you know, we can, we can ask a few more basic questions and quickly analyze this using open source tools like Pandas available to you here. So the first thing I, you, one might ask is, is there any difference between the sexes? So this little pivot table is, what is done with the pandas library, very similar, it, it almost identical, to a pivot table one would make in Excel. So you know, if, if you're kind of new to the code, to writing code or using Python, like these, these tools are accessible, familiar, and, and very welcoming to you. And in this case, I, I want to show you that with a very basic pivot table. So when we look, we can look at this, we can, we can pivot the data based on gender, and we can see the different counts among men and women. And then the, the mean here is very important. This is the survival rate. So it, it's what it, this is telling us is on average, 72 or 73% of the women survived, 19% of the men survived. So by and large, the men tended to perish much more frequently. OK, that's somewhat interesting. So if I were to think of, like, if I were to start to build a model, I might say, well, I would certainly want to bias hot leads here. We, we want to we find the male names, or the names that are indicative of male passengers to call to, right, to sell them funeral services. What if we add in next, like, what, OK, let's keep asking questions. What if we add in passenger class? So now we'll just we'll edit our pivot table a little bit. We'll add in another field here. And passenger class is first class, second class, and third class. So this starts to look a little bit more interesting. We notice that women in first class survived at about 96 or 97 percent. Yes, I can make it bigger. Thank you for asking, um, Santiago. And is this a little bit better? Can you all see this? Somewhat. I may. I'm. I'm going to be. I'm going to plead nervousness here and say I'm. I'm going to have a tough time kind of zooming in. Um, I do apologize. I should have thought this through. I didn't quite look at it. Uh, I should. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just a little too jittery up here. I apologize. <laughs> um, but what I will do is instead of pointing out the minutia, I'll just speak to it at a high level, and we'll keep this thing rolling. <laughs> so what I, what I just want to point out with these pivot tables is we, as we look across passenger class and gender, when we add in that extra feature, what we're seeing is that while men certainly were more likely to perish, men in first class survived at almost twice the rate of men in second or third class. Similarly, women in third class were only survived at about only one of every, like one of two were able to make it out. Whereas by and large, we saw that 70, you know, 70 percent of women made it. Meaning that if you were in third class, whether you were a man or a woman, it really drastically hurt your chances of getting off the boat alive. Meaning those people would be ones we should reach out to again. Um, so then the next question we might ask ourselves is, what if we added in age? Okay, we've looked at passenger class, we've looked at gender. What if we add in age? And the first thing we'll see here is we get this kind of nasty pivot table, right? In my mind, this is, uh, maybe it's not nasty. That might be unfair to the pivot table. But this is not easily consumable, right? So what we want to do probably, or one thing we could do, is to bucket our ages. So instead of saying we want to pivot on every single age, how well did 37-year-olds do? Maybe we don't care. Let's just pivot on minors and adults. So we'll say if you are, with this one little line here, this lambda function, we can quickly filter our data or add a, add a column to our data set and say, if you're under 18, we're going to call you a minor. And if you're, over, if you're 18 or over, we're going to call you an adult. And we just add that in right here. So now we can go back and do another pivot table 
And what we can see is when we look at now by gender, by passenger class, and by age bucket, we can see, okay, look, minors, for example, in second class, all of them in our existing data set survived. So if we're looking through our manifest and we see a child who is in, no, in second class, maybe we don't want to call them and offer their family our funeral services. Um, this gives us a little bit more, a little more insight into the data. We can see that minors, when we look at the males specifically, the minors tended to do much better, right? 85% survival versus adults 30% in first class. So we're, we're starting to see a little bit more insight into our data set. Now, if you, I want to pause real quickly here. This is where we're going to, now, we've done some exploratory analysis. This was relatively easy to do. We're using pandas. You don't have to be born in the matrix to do some of the things that I just showed you. Um, now we want to baseline our existing heuristic, right? Because we said all businesses use, we have rules of thumb that we use to govern our business to think about the future. If you attended Stan's GPU talk, he said, listen, if you, your machine learning models should improve your existing accuracy. So what's, what's the heuristic we would use, you know, kind of common sense, not maybe common sense, or his, you know, kind of historical knowledge to say, who do we think survived? Well, with the, you know, with C, or with, 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 uh, with boat, I want to say crashes, that's probably the wrong word, sinking, uh, we tend to think women and children first, right? That was the, the law of the sea. So we should build a model. I think we, we must do this, right? To we must build a model to say, hey, we're just going to predict that women and children survived and men perished. How well does that perform? This is our baseline, right? Before we start building any machine learning model, before we do anything fancy, we first must know what, what would this kind of rule of thumb give us. So we're going to do this with a few lines of Python, nothing crazy. Um, and in this case, we're just saying, hey, if you are a female, or that's what the little pipe character is, or a minor, you survived. Otherwise, you died. And then we're going to go ahead and score this model. And when we score this model, I hopefully you all can see, at least this is a little bit bigger, what you'd see is that we, our model would be 76% accurate. Now, we've, m we've done something, we, we've overfitted, we've looked at all of our data, we didn't split up our data into tra uh, <laughs> trust, test and training, um, but you know, what, we've, what we've been able to do here is say, look, women and children live, men die, 76% accurate, we could take that to the, that's what the business is operating at right now. This is our current level. So, at this stage, we can say, all right, if we can't beat 76%, it's, it's not worth doing, okay? It's not worth adding the complexity, maybe my opinion on that. Um, and we can go a little bit deeper. So somebody say, hey, you showed me a second ago this pivot table where you used ages, right? You, we, we transitioned between, we had ages, we ha also had uh, passenger class. Can we use those in the model? So we can say, can we, can we differentiate on passenger class as well? And yes, we can do that. And let's just go ahead and quickly see what that looks like. So in this case, all we're doing here is we're, we're going to take, we're going to take kind of like another assumption, if you will. And we're going to say, if the average in our pivot table, if the average survival rate is 50% or better, we're going to go ahead and label you as somebody who survived. If it's less than 50%, we're going to say you died, right? These would be our hot leads. So when we do that, and then go ahead and score this again, and I, and I want to emphasize here that we're, the model we're building is just this pivot table. We're just using, this is, could be all done in Excel. We're using Python here. This is not supposed to be complicated, right? This is the, the basic exploratory data, data analysis approach. Um, and now that we've, we've, done, we've built this model and we've scored it, what we'll see is we get a slight increase. So when we add in passenger class, now, and we say, if, if on, based on the historical data, 50% or better, we're going to go ahead and score that, we're going to get 80%. So approximately 80% just using pivot tables, right? And we've been able to get a 3 or 4% increase in our women and children get off the boat first, in our heuristic, by doing some exploratory data analysis. So at this point, I would kind of throw my hands up and say, I really need to get a data scientist in here, a real one, to help me do some machine learning, right? So in Anaconda Enterprise, it's very easy to share your project with others. So I'm going to come back to my, or I'm going to get out of the maximum view. I'm going to come back to my projects tab, and I'm going to share my project. And I want to share it with Victor. If you haven't, I'm sure you've seen Victor. He's the very large guy sitting somewhere up front, I'm sure. Maybe he left because he doesn't think my talk is that interesting. But I'm going to share it with Victor, and now Victor is going to be able to log into the project and he will see exactly what I see, have the access to the same data, have access to the code, all changes being uh, committed internally to a Git server. Um, I'm going to pretend like I'm logging back in as, as Victor here. So now Victor's job is to build the actual machine learning model. So let's go ahead and quickly do that, and we'll open this back up. So I'm going to build this model. 
And I'm going to run all these cells. Excellent. Oh, wrong notebook. Run all. Here we go. So when we when we approach, we take or we, we we're going to use a logistic regression. We're going to use scikit-learn. When we do this, there are a couple of things that are going to change from how we modeled our data with with pandas, with pivot tables, with something that could be done with a spreadsheet. Principally, we want to start to change the way we we uh, represent our data. So in this case, we have information like s gender or sex as female, male. We want this to be a number. These, these algorithms prefer things to be, to be numbers. We also want to take things like age, which the number, you know, we can have a spectrum of ages. And in, in our case, it would be from roughly, roughly slightly more than zero, like a newborn, to I think the oldest person in this data set is in their 80s. And we want we want to standardize these. We don't want there to be a discrepancy between we don't want to unfairly bias someone, you know, a value of 80 versus a value of two. We just want the age to be something that is used as a predictor. So what we're gonna do real quickly is we're just gonna use this method get dummies. And all this is doing, and I think the, the technical term might be one hot encoding, but what we're doing here is we're just saying if the passenger has one of these features, make it a one. If they don't, make it a zero. So we're kind of exploding out or uh, uh, folding out all of these columns to give us a bunch more columns. So if we went from uh, fair being a, a, a number, or in this case, cabin, we're going to say if you were in cabin B5, one, otherwise zero. So this is an important step to make more features available to our model. Now, that's basically the, the extent of our pre-processing. Now we're going to go ahead and split up our data. So we want to split our data into a, a training set and a test set. The reason why is if we don't do this, we, we could overfit like we probably did in our, in our pivot table example. And when we go ahead and run this model, we're going to split this up. We're going to run this, and we're going to run it a couple different times because we're, we're randomly generating the training set and the test set. We're going to see right off the bat, using a logistic regression, a model accuracy of 96.5%, 97% which is pretty incredible, right? Oh, oh my goodness. And if any of you have tried the competition where this data set is featured, that would be a very high score. So on one hand, we might, I would be tempted to pat myself you know, very proudly on the back and say, great job, Gus, You're, you built a, an amazing model. But then I'd realize that I, I probably did something wrong. Like I, 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 I'm not that good at my job, something's up. And when I, look, when I look at the data here, that, and, I've, and again, it's, I just want to point out how easy it was to build this model here. It's dot fit and then dot predict or dot score. Very, very simple. We did a little pre-processing. We have a model. And now our model is 97% accurate, right? Oh my goodness, throw this thing into the business. Well, we should take a look at the data a little bit. And if you've been hanging out at a data science conference like, like we all have for the last couple of days, you tend to get feedback on your presentation from other people, data scientists in the crowd, especially if you hang out at the demo station. Um, so I've gotten some feedback. And while we were able to quickly build this model and, and improve our accuracy, what we realized and we're, is that there was one, one feature in particular. Uh, the boat feature is the, the column header here. And the boat corresponds, at least we suspect, to the lifeboat that the passenger was on. So if someone was on a lifeboat, their, their ability to survive the, the, the sinking of the Titanic was very high, right? Because they made it to a boat. If they didn't make it to a boat, and not everyone on a lifeboat survived, but if they didn't make it to a boat, then their, their, their perishing or whether or not they're going to become a hot lead for us is very low. But what this means is we've either built like an incredible model or actually we've used some of, we have a, we have a feature in our model that we should probably remove, right? Like if we knew someone made it to a lifeboat, that would be excellent. But realistically, that's something maybe as from a business standpoint, we might not actually know that data, right? Like that's not going to that we've, we're, we're, our model is too good. So let's simplify it a little bit, and let's make a really basic, let's make a little bit more basic model that we can understand. And this is going to look kind of like our pivot table. And we're just going to use sex, age, passenger class, and then, of course, the survival rate. I, I'm sorry, we're going we're gonna to include that in the initial data set. And then we're going to split those out. We want to we split out the, whether or not they survive so we can actually score this model. And what we're going to see with our logistic regression is we get a we get an accuracy of about 80%, or almost 81%. So we've been able to incrementally improve, not the drastic 97% accuracy, but we started with women and children are going to survive 76%, build a pivot table, 78%, logistic regression, 80%. Now, we, at this point, 
it's great that we have a model. We think we have something that's useful, but the only way we can actually make this useful for the business is to publish it. If it stays on my laptop, even in this you know, beautiful user interface of Anaconda Enterprise, it is utterly worthless to the business. Right? It should not stay here. It shouldn't stay in my inbox. It needs to be published, deployed out, so that the salespeople, when they come in, will receive their notification. These are the hot leads. You need to contact these people. So real quickly, let's show you how you can actually deploy these models. And in Anaconda Enterprise, we make this very, very simple. So I'm going to show you one way. There are basically any n number of ways you can deploy something. Anything you can write in Anaconda, anything you can write in Python or R, you can deploy. I'm going to use an internal package called Publish or Web Publisher. And if I wrap my function, in this case, my function is just going to take an input, which would be the input for my model, um, the, the age, the gender, the passenger class. And uh, I'm going to wrap that with this one line decorator here, at Publish. And when I do that, this, this endpoint, or Anaconda Enterprise, will generate a URL for us at this endpoint that is accessible over a RESTful interface. So we now have an API that we can hit from any, any, uh, any RESTful interface. What this means, in, in let's just go ahead and show it. So here's, here's how one would actually deploy. Um, I would come to my Deploy tab here. I can name the deployment. I can choose my revision. So if I want to roll back to the model that I built six months ago, I can, uh, this is where I would choose. Uh, and then I can choose my deployment command. So we can deploy, as I mentioned, we can de deploy basically anything. So I can deploy the notebook itself. I can deploy any number of models inside of those notebooks that are just wrapped with that decorator. I could write uh, a full-blown web application. If I wanted to write, recreate Instagram inside of my Anaconda Enterprise, um, <laughs> inside of Anaconda Enterprise, you'd be welcome to do that. Anyway, so I choose, my, I choose my command, and I click Deploy. And now when I come over to my Deployments tab, I'm able to access this API. So I'll go ahead, and I've it's not much to look at here because this is an API, but what's really important is that you have this externally available URL, and you can also generate a token. So now we can authenticate to this model, any user can authenticate to this model, and we can be sure that it's being used or being consumed securely. So I'll go ahead and open up a uh, command line terminal here, and you know, fingers crossed this works. We'll go ahead and hit that URL with, our, with the information that we need along with that token and we'll get our results. So in our case, we're going to guess a 45-year-old passenger, female, um, oh, excuse me, male, and the result from the model was deceased. This is a hot lead. You should call this person. Okay. Now, if I want to share these things, and you, this model itself, you know, consuming this can be done, again, we could also hit this through requests or anything else, um, but let's say I, I have a deployment that's the notebook itself. So I want to share the analysis that we initially did with my, my business audience, and I want them to be able to run this notebook. They, too, can come in here and grab the externally available URL and then come over to any web browser. And we'll go ahead and just refresh this and access, access the, the deployment. So this gives, them, this gives anyone, people who aren't paying us money for an Anaconda Enterprise license can consume anything that you produce in Anaconda Enterprise. And I think that's a, a, an important point. So anything that you build and deploy is consumable by whom, whomever you would like to have use, that, use your work. You don't have to be an Anaconda Enterprise license holder. Go ahead and close this out. And similarly, we can share deployments just like we did, sh just like we shared our project. We can share them with, uh, in this case, I'll go ahead and add Tom. And I think maybe, I hope you everyone saw his Dask ML talk. It was excellent. Uh, and so now Tom would have access to this deployment, and he would be able to use it. He would be able to manipulate it or, or work with it inside of Anaconda Enterprise. Similarly, or as I, as I said, you could share it externally with other people via the deployment URL and the token for authentication. OK. So let's hop back quickly and kind of recap what we've covered so far. So in our, let's just review our analysis. Anaconda Enterprise let us connect to everything we needed, right? We had access to our data. We had access to compute instances. I'm not running anything on my laptop. It's all running on a server. I had the packages I needed, the powerful open source tools that you want to use to do your job, available in one place, ready to go. And it was really easy to share everything that we built with our colleagues. Similarly, when we wanted to build a model, we were able to quickly build a model, mo model with a pivot table, and we used pandas to do that. Then we iterated on that a little bit, and we used a machine learning model, a logistic regression from the scikit-learn package. And that took a couple lines of code, and it actually put us in a little bit of hot water, right? We were able to build something that looked very predictive, but may not have actually been really accurate or useful to the business. But the point being, we were able to do this very, very quickly, right? We grabbed the packages we needed, we built our models, and then finally, 
we were actually able to deploy this model, to therefore put it in the hands of the salespeople, put it in the hands of the business people who actually need it, need to use it, who are going to impact the business. So we analyzed our lead data. We, we built a baseline, right? We figured out, okay, the, our, our, our heuristic, how we make predictions, how we look at the future in our business was a 76% roughly accurate model. We were able to make that baseline. We then built a machine learning model to improve upon that, um, and then we deployed that model. So Anaconda Enterprise, I think, I hope, made this really easy. It gave us an interactive development environment accessible from the browser. So I didn't have to install anything on my computer. I didn't have to ask IT for any permissions. I it made it very simple to share this project with my colleagues, Victor and Tom. They didn't ha I didn't email anyone a file. They didn't have to clone down a Git repo. They didn't have to go to an internal repository to pull down packages. Everything just worked. And then we had this very simple one-click model deployment. So we were able to share both the notebook and the API and our machine learning model as an API by just clicking a button. I didn't ask IT for a server. I didn't SCP files over to something. I didn't go use, I didn't spin up an EC2 instance. And I don't have to manage any of this. It's all done for me. It's all done securely. It just works. So what should we do next? Or what should you all do next? One, I would recommend downloading the Titanic data set if you'd like to play with it. I have a link here in the slides. Uh, I believe this is available from yeah, uh, we don't use that word, but the, there's, a, there's a university that also has the version I use specifically. Um, but then also, I would encourage you to start an Anaconda Enterprise test drive. So if you want to test out Anaconda Enterprise, we offer a 30-day free test drive. You have your own uh, instance hosted on Google Cloud. All you have to do is sign up, and once you log in, you'll be able to do some data science. You'll be able to play with Anaconda Enterprise, see if it makes sense for you. And just to show you kind of quickly how one could do that, we have... Again, this test drive here is hosted on Google Cloud. Happy to share the link out with people. You'll click this link to try a free test drive. And then you'll come to a, a page managed by Orbitera. You'll create an account. And once you create an account and put in your information, you know, I promise we won't spam you or harass you, uh, put your info in. You'll get an email from Orbitera, and it will include the URL to your project or to your Anaconda Enterprise instance. And you'll have a full installation. You will be the only one who has access to it. You'll have access to the UI as, we, as I just walked you through, that UI. You'll also have access to our auth console, so you, if you wanted to uh, look at how our identity management solution, how you actually integrate or create users' groups and map those to roles, things like that, you'd have access to that. You also have access to our operations console, so if you really want to dive deep into the logs, look at kind of how Anaconda Enterprise is set up under the hood, you're welcome to do that as well. And with that, I think I will take questions. I'm sure there's a ton of them out there. So please fire away. And if you don't have questions, I'm going to ask at least two. <laughs> yeah. OK, hey, I see one coming up from Liz in the back. She said, hey, Gus. What, you know, at what team size, how many people should I have before I think about using Anaconda Enterprise? If, at what number of people does it make sense to actually use, an enterprise, to use this product and not just use Anaconda distribution? Well, what we've seen typically is when you start to get to four to five data scientists or people who are using Python or R to analyze data, when you get to those numbers, the, the incremental effects of sharing, of sharing work, of working together become relatively difficult and you would benefit. And the nice thing with Anaconda Enterprise is you can scale from those four or five people to 500, no problem. We're gonna, we're gonna manage that for you. Related to that, because I can see some people scratching their head and wanting to ask, is why shouldn't I just build this myself? You know, why, sh why shouldn't I install Jupyter Hub on a shared server and go ahead and run this? I don't, I don't need Anaconda Enterprise. Well, there are a couple of really good reasons why. And one in particular that I didn't, we didn't talk about today, but you may have seen if you attended Daniel Rodriguez's talk, is if you have a Spark cluster, or if you have anything else that you want to integrate with, we're going to take care of that for you, and we're going to make it seamless and simple. Simil so, if, uh, and to speak to that very briefly, if you want to use, let's say you have a Spark cluster, which many people do, they've invested a lot of time and effort into building those, if you want to connect to that from Anaconda Enterprise, it's very easy. You open up a notebook, you, write your, you create your Spark context, and you write your code. And similarly, if you want to get the packages that you use in your local environment or in your Anaconda Enterprise environment, on the data nodes in your cluster, such that when you write something like import pandas, it actually works, that will be available to, to you as well. We make that very easy. There's a, actually 